Okay, so let's start. Okay. Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Frank from Wisconsin Medical. You are so welcome to attend our Wisconsin Global Dandelion Program with a mission to widely popularize the point of care ultrasound utilization in, in medical practice, such as anesthesiology, pain management, MSK, intensive care, and emergency medicine. By in cooperation with different experts across the globe to do online webinars or in-person workshop trainings. So far, we have completed over 700 webinars nationally and internationally since 2020, attracted over 180,000 doctors attended, received over 3.2 million reviews and comments. This time, we are honored to have invited eight renowned MSK experts in the United States to participate in our program, MSK Ultrasound Webinar Series. In these two months, they will present a comprehensive webinar series about musculoskeletal, including lecture topics on osteobiologic therapies and the ultrasound utilization in MSK practice, covering common body parts like shoulder, elbow, hand, wrist, hip, foot, ankle, and the knee. Here, I would like to express our most gratitude to these eight respectable experts. Thank you. So let me show my screen again. So today is the uh, <clears throat> second webinar of our MSK ultrasound webinar series program. We invited Dr. Michael Mann as speaker and Mark Caster as moderator to lecture with topic on ultrasound in M MSK practice shoulder. Mark Caster has abundant experience in MSK and ultrasound he started MSK and the cardiac diagnostic ultrasound profession since 2008, became ultrasound consultant since 2012, and MSK instructor since 2014. He is a member of uh, several famous societies like American Registry for Diagnostic Medical Sonography Society and the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography. Moreover, he is a regular moderator for all of the seven webinars in this MSK ultrasound webinar series. So Mark, could you please introduce today's speaker, Dr. Michael Mann? Good evening, everyone, and good morning to some of you. Uh, tonight's uh, presentation will be on sh a shoulder by Dr. Michael Meng, a good friend of mine. I've taught with him many times and He's got a great presentation ahead of you for the shoulder diagnostics. Uh, wait a moment. And we want to welcome Dr. Uh, Michael Meng to the presentation tonight. And he is a, has a vast uh, repertoire in the MSK field. He, he works in rheumatology, interventional medicine, orthopedics, and musculoskeletal ultrasounds. He has uh, published multiple publications and presentations. And he also does a lot in the field of regenerative medicine, PRP, bone marrow aspirate. And he's done a lot of case studies on knee osteoarthritis, uh, phantom bladder sensation, ultrasound, valuation of rotator cuff at the intervals. Um, he's got a doctor in chiropractic. He's got his BS. He's RMSK. And he's also a registered nurse. So let's put it up for uh, Mike, Dr. Michael Mang. Let him start the presentation on the shoulder. 
Great. All right. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. So we're going to get started here. Let me share my screen with everybody. And hopefully everyone can see that. There we go. Perfect. All right. So let's talk tonight. It's an honor to be here. And I thank everyone for uh, joining us tonight, this, this morning, depending on where you are, of course. Um, I'm, I'm uh, Michael Meng. Um, kind of got an interesting story in ultrasound. So I, I kind of got my start in ultrasound back in about 2005. So I started working at a rheumatology practice in 2005. And there was this need for, uh, for ultrasound. They had a bunch of dusty ultrasound machines sitting around the office. The, the owner was kind of a uh, forefront thinker and thought everyone would pick it up and run with it. And they'd take over and start doing all these ultrasounds like they were doing in Europe at the time. And uh, what we learned real quick was that uh, absolutely nobody, uh, no, nobody at all in the practice took up the ultrasound. So I kind of took it upon myself. Um, at the time, there wasn't these fabulous classes. We didn't have a lot of education. There were a couple books here and there. So it, it was really a lot more just, you know, learning how to operate the thing, teaching myself. So uh, majority of what I've learned over the years actually has kind of been self-taught. Um, you know, I'd find stuff on MRIs and try to find it on ultrasound, see if I could reproduce it. Um, so it's been a been a kind of a learning curve for me, but it's been a very exciting one. Uh, been very rewarding. Um, I've had opportunities to, you know, work at pretty prestigious places, do some amazing things. Um, it's taken me a long way, so I'm, I'm really grateful for ultrasound and, and everything that it's done in my life. So, so let's go ahead and get started. All right. So we're going to go ahead here and go to the first slide. Um, I always kind of like to look at silhouettes when I talk about ultrasound. Um, you know, everyone's looking. You know, used to looking at X-rays. They're used to looking at these images where you've got points of reference. You've got, hey, I'm looking at someone's neck because I can see their head attached to it. Um, you don't have that with ultrasound. You got to look at it a little bit different. So, you know, this picture, it kind of reminds me of a wrist, actually. When I look at these mountains, I actually see a scaphoid and a lunate in there. So a couple bones in the hand because you see those silhouettes and you start to pick up on other things like the different densities of the color. You pick up on uh, what different things mean. You start to look at it with the different color glasses and then you realize you need to learn more anatomy. <laughs> so once you learn the anatomy, all these things really start to pick up and you get to really learn the anatomy. So ultrasound is... You know, anybody starting out, it's it's really anatomy dependent. You really have to know that anatomy. So let's go ahead and start looking into this just a little bit. All right. So first question everybody says, you know, why should I do an ultrasound when I can just get an MRI? It's pretty standard. MRIs are fantastic. Nothing against MRIs. Um, but multiple studies have been performed, and especially in shoulders. Um, shoulder ultrasounds are, are very, very useful. Um, this study actually comes from the, uh, I might say it wrong, but the Bahana Journal. And so what they concluded was ultrasound is comparable in the MRI evaluation of shoulder impingement, rotator cuff tears, and most likely, I mean, more accurately in full thickness tears. It's less expensive, more availability, uh, real-time assessments. And they concluded that it should be used as the first investigation line in shoulder patients. And so I think those are most important takeaway is, is that should be used as the first line of investigation. I, I disagree a little bit. I think clinical examination should be the first line. Um, and if you do it like I do it, I do clinical examination and the ultrasound at the same time. But so let's go on to the next slide here. So this is another one. Uh, this actually comes from the current sports medicine reports journal. Um, it's kind of long. But, you know, they, they looked at labral tears, which when I first started doing ultrasounds, I kept getting pushback about anterior labral tears, slap lesions. They like, I'd had orthos that would tell me that the only reason they order ultrasound, and I mean ultrasound, MRIs was to see if there's a slap lesion. And then they had to get an MRI with arthrogram anyway, because they didn't really see it on the, on the MRI as well as they would have liked. Um, you know, the literature supports that the MR arthrogram is the best way to look at a slap lesion. Um, there's not really much denying that. But in this study, they actually concluded that the combination of uh, physical examination and ultrasound could be superior even to MR arthrogram. So, so something to consider when you're doing this. Um, it, it brings me to an important topic too. You know, the ultrasound 
especially in musculoskeletal and other aspects, if you're, you know, if you're the examiner looking at it, you have the best picture of that ultrasound. The person doing the scan is the best picture. They also have the clinical examination. They've got, you know, the, the interview with the patient. You've got your physical presentation. You've got all, all of these different aspects of what's going on. You've got a really good idea what's going on with that patient. You're doing that ultrasound. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. All right. Doing that ultrasound, you're uh, going through, you've got ideas. You're like, oh, this is my differentials. And you can actually go through with that ultrasound and pick out those differentials and, and, and provide evidence for yourself that this is really what you're looking at. I think that's the true value of the ultrasound. All right. So we're going to go on here. So this, this list is a differential diagnosis list. It comes from an orthopedic website. Um, is it the best? I don't know. Is it pretty comprehensive? Yeah, I think so. I think it's pretty good. All right. So they're going to go through these different diagnoses. Um, I plugged in the ultrasound findings and some of the dynamic ultrasound findings that you're going to see with these conditions. Um, you know, you can add to this list. Of course, it's not not complete. Um, but these are some of the differentials that you're looking at in a shoulder. OK, so, you know, according to most of the literature, about 60 percent of shoulder problems stem from impingement. All right. So real important to look for impingement. Of course, your physical findings are, include your range of motion, your positive impingement testing. But there's a lot of value with the ultrasound too. Right? Uh, we're going to talk about that. But you can you can look at muscle thicknesses. You can mus look at muscle firing patterns. There are impingement views you can look at, and there's even some measurements you can take to make this a a more intra and inter reliability type exam where it actually becomes more quantitative. Uh, a second one we're going to look at is a little bit about bursal impingement. Um, the most common, most read about, most studied, of course, are rotator cuff tears. And uh, like we talked about, the ultrasound is very accurate for seeing those. Uh, ones that are not talked about as much, uh, sc suprascapular neuropathy, all right? So, you know, you're looking for muscle atrophy. Well, ultrasound is a great way to see that. You can see differential patterns in the, uh, in the muscles. You can look at the uh, myofibril distances. You, you can measure the distance between the, myofibril, uh, the myofibrous bands. Um, you're going to see anatomic variants, you know, that are quite present, especially in people's scalenes muscles. Uh, they might have a nerve taking an unusual course, predisposing them to uh, suprascapular neuropathy. Uh, there might be a lesion in the posterior triangle of the neck, and you're also looking for some trapezial dysfunction. Um, all these things are, are readily available to see on the ultrasound. Of course, after that, we're going to talk about instability and uh, some uh, dislocation type things. We're going to go to multidirectional instability, uh, unidirectional. So a lot of what you're looking at there, of course, is your apprehension test, your relocation test. So on the ultrasound, you're looking for bank heart lesions. There's also measurements that we're going to look at for dislocations. Uh, dynamically, you'll see some, some, some findings, but they're kind of soft findings. Uh, labral tears, you know, so you're looking at your, your Mayo, your Shear, your O'Brien. But uh, on ultrasound, you know, one of the pathognomonics we learned is actually instability of the anterior uh, glenohumeral ligament is almost pathognomonic for a slap lesion. Well, that's readily available in the rotator cuff interval. Uh, we can also look at the biceps insertion onto the labrum, the anchoring mechanism, and we can even contract the biceps to see if there's a dynamic uh, separation. We can look for cysts, look for paralabral cysts in the sphenoglenoid notch. We can also look for them in the anterior. Uh, biceps tendinopathy, the next here, is readily available. Uh, we have to look at proximal and distal, of course. Um, Popeye signs are not always present, especially not with you know when you don't have the full thickness. So those are important to look at. Um, you know, acromioclavicular joint things going on here. You know, they're, they're pretty self-explanatory when you see them, but uh, it's always nice to look at. You can get a measurement of it. You can see how unstable it is. You can hand someone a weight and see how much that thing separates. You can look at the conoid ligaments. You can look at the acromioclavicular ligaments. A lot of stuff going on there uh, with the AC joint, with instability. Uh, we can look for, you know, non-fusion of the acromium as a... Uh, as a source of pain and instability too. It's readily available in ultrasound. Of course, osteoarthritis, degenerative joint disease, it's kind of a combination of a lot of these different symptoms. Uh, osteochondral defect. Uh, not all these are readily available in ultrasound, I'll admit it. There's some that are interarticular and you can't really get a window to find them, but you can see some of these. Uh, inflammatory arthritis. This is another well-researched topic that's very readily available in ultrasound. Uh, one of my favorite topics is actually the scapulo dyskinesis. So this is one of my new things I really like to look at. I like to look at the nerves. I like to look at all the fascial planes. It's pretty fascinating stuff for me. I actually include long thoracic nerve with my scapulo 
just kinesis uh, studies. Um, I find it's one of the three nerves involved. In fact, if you look on my ultrasound findings list, I even listed it there, but I didn't want to deviate from the list on the orthopedic website here. Um, so we can look for, you know, um, you know, like stuff related to diabetes, um, not something I have a lot of experience in, quite honestly, and I really haven't seen that much. Uh, we have Parsonage-Turner syndrome. I think I've only seen this once, uh, but again, there are some ultrasound findings that are readily available, and if it's right next to you and you suspect someone has it, put that probe on there and find it. Pretty cool. Uh, cervical radiculopathy, one of the biggest differentials for uh, shoulder pain. We can see those nerve roots and we can look for evidence of impingement, swelling, all kinds of good stuff. And then lastly, avascular necrosis, probably not one of the strongest indications to your ultrasound. Um, by the time you see avascular necrosis findings in ultrasound, that person's in pretty bad shape. So if you're suspecting that, you know, this may not be your first line. All right. So let's go ahead and get started here. So in this study here, this comes from the BMC Medical Disorders Journal. So they actually wanted to quantify um, subacromial impingement. So like I said, there are, are impingement views where you can dynamically look at it. Very hard to quantify. Uh, the inter-rater -reli inter reliability and even intra-rater reliability, pretty low on those studies. So this was a case-controlled study, and they actually looked at for impingement where they measured the acromial humeral distance, and they measured the thickness of the supraspinatus tendon. So using these numbers, they actually could correlate together um, you know, the size of the canal and the size of the train running through the canal and uh, what happens related to this. And with a very strong uh, correlation between that and impingement syndrome, diagnosed impingement syndrome. Okay, so what does that look like? So in this slide here, we're actually measuring the distance between the acromium and the humerus. Now in, in their study, they actually measured what we have here is the red line. So they measured from the tip of the acromium to the humeral head. Um, I measure it two ways, which is why on this screen, you can actually see there's a measurement going from the tip of the chromium. And I use the apex of the greater tuberosity as my point. Um, the reason I do this is because I can make this reliable measurement. Uh, depending on where you measure, you're gonna, might, you might come up with different distances. You might come up with different thicknesses. Uh, the greater tuberosity may be a little bit different shaped. If you just pick a random point, it may not be that accurate. So for my purpose, I actually find the apex of the greater tuberosity and measure there. Okay. So what the red line measurement here, which got cut off on the screen here, is actually 1.4 millimeters for this particular study. Uh, using the measurement I prefer, we got 1.26, um, give or take. Okay. So we're going to go down here. We're going to continue. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide here. Sorry. I'm going to go back up. So in this one here, Oh, how do I get rid of that? Um, sorry. So in this slide here, we're actually measuring the thickness of the supraspinatus tendon. All right. So again, I like to make this more reproducible. Um, so if you see here, I, this is actually the long head of the biceps tendon, this oval shaped density. So what I'm measuring here is actually the, the free edge of the supraspinatus. So I'm going to where the free edge basically ends. So if you look at the curvature of the supraspinatus tendon here, and then we have the cord coming underneath here. So we're actually measuring the thickness of the supraspinatus tendon when it becomes off of the, when it comes off of the free edge. Okay. So in this situation here, that measured 1.24 millimeters. If we do our little calculation, we actually get our ratio and our ratio here is 89%. All right. So for uh, subacromial impingement, um, they actually, generally use a ratio of about 93%. So this particular patient here, which happens to be my son, uh, does not appear to have any uh, impingement syndrome going on in the situation. All right, so let's look at that a little bit. So we talked about you know, how to measure it. So let's look at some of these reliability measures, okay? So in, an, in another study here, and this was done in the Knee Surgical Sports Journal, and so they actually did the same thing. They, they measured it and they, they looked at the, the different measurements and their determination actually uh, that the, the thickness of the supraspinatus tendon had more to do with it than the size of the, uh, acrom the, the gap, the tunnel that's going through. Um, so they looked at, you know, they looked at a unilateral presentation. So impingement syndrome on one side, not on the other. They took differences between the two. And what they found was a difference greater than 1.1 millimeters of thickness in the in the tunnel, so the acromial greater tuberosity distance, and 2.1 millimeters in the supraspinatus tendon thickness. Uh, 
corresponded with, with symptoms in diagnosed subacromal impingement syndrome. Okay, so let's look at the reliability of this. So in, in another study here, and this was in the, the Journal of Science of Medical Sports. So they looked through here, and this was an inter-reliability testing score. And what they determined using these measurements actually had very high predictors of subacromal impingement syndrome. So I, I love the dynamic stuff. It's, it's great. I use it all the time. Um, but reliability, inter-reliability, and uh, external reliability is not proven. Um, using these measurements, we, we actually look like we may have something that, that I could scan and Mark could scan later, and we could have something to actually compare and measure. So I, I do think it's, it's, it's a value. Okay. So we're going to go along here and still talk about impingement because it's, it's kind of one of the more important things here. And this is another journal, and basically this is the same study. Uh, but if you read between the lines here, they're actually looking at the contraction thickness of the infraspinatus. OK, so this was actually, you know, this was done using uh, very, very well controlled studies on 39 patients. And they looked at this cross study where they uh, measured the thickness of the infraspinatus tendon. And again, they measured it from the apex of the sphenoglenoid notch. So they had a reliable measuring site and they measured the thickness of contraction, the thickness of relaxation. Now, they, they further strengthened the, the, the value of the study by uh, they were using a dynamometer and they were actually having the static hold when they were measuring the tendon resistance they actually had at 20 millimeters of mercury so they had a standard contraction in here and they concluded a 96 percent inter rate of reliability uh, to 98 percent and inter related reliability 87 to 92 percent so this is actually looking at the difference in the thickness of the infraspinatus during the contraction and relaxation phase corresponding to subacromial impingement syndrome. On the next slide, this is kind of what that looked like. So in the red here, this is the asymptomatic shoulder. The blue is the symptomatic shoulder. So you can see at rest, the symptomatic shoulder thickness was lower and nearly equal at contraction. The asymptomatic shoulder uh, was, was thicker at relaxation and equal at contraction. So they were proving Basically, what they were doing here is proving dysfunction of the muscle with contraction due to this impingement syndrome. Okay. So this is actually looking at the infraspinatus. Pretty good. All right, so let's go on. So this is what that looked like. So in the in the image here, on, so they're looking at this is the flexed. This is relaxed. So of course, this is our glenohumeral joint. So of course, we go down through the different layers. We're looking at the posterior aspect of the shoulder here. And we're actually measuring the thickness of the infraspinatus tendon at a fixed point, relaxed and contracted. And that's where this measurement came from. And that's what it looks like. Okay. So we're going to go on. Now, this is a this is a pretty fun story here. So, like like we said, I, I do work in rheumatology. Um, this is a dynamic, and I, I didn't put videos in here because every time I do presentation with videos, it gets choppy on the web and you can't see anything. So Prefer this would be stuff better done, of course, in a live setting where you could see the video, but we're doing the best we can. Um, so in, in this picture here, we're actually performing an, an impingement test. Okay. So of course we have our os down here. This is our greater tuberosity is the bone density, and this is the supraspinatus tendon coming into insertion. Okay. So internal external rotation, of course, at the apex of the supraspinatus tendon, we have our long head of the biceps. This is our bicipital groove. Okay. So when we increase the pressure in the joint, fluid came out of the joint, demonstrating bursal impingement. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're very rarely going to see this much fluid, okay? This, this, this is a polymyalgia rheumatica patient. Uh, I chose it because it's very, you know, very, very easy to see the fluid coming from the joint. Um, but that's, in clinical practice, you're not going to see that that much, okay? Uh, this is a this is a more traditionally taught subacromial impingement view. So we're at the distal acromion, humeral head. We could take our measurements here, but this is basically done with the impingement test. So the orthopedic impingement test with the arm rotated appropriately, abducted, palm up, elevated 90 degrees. And in this situation, we could actually see fluid coming from under the acromion, kind of like a clown's balloon. It's getting squeezed by the acromion and the supraspinatus tendon and getting pushed down the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So we can see that fluid coming out here. Okay. So that's bursal impingement. This is a dynamic view. Okay. So this is with the arm has already been abducted. 
All right. This is my favorite view to look at subacromial subdeltoid impingement, okay, or subacromial subdeltoid bursa impingement and supraspinatus impingement. So uh, on the right side of the screen here, this is our AC joint, okay. So we can see the acromion, we can see the clavicle. Sorry, I can't spell, um, but it was on the ultrasound image. <laughs> so uh, in between the bones, we we have see can see our acromioclavicular joint. Okay, this is our joint space, and below we see these fibers. These fibers are supraspinatus fibers. We're actually looking through the AC joint to the supraspinatus. Okay. If we were to move the arm, if we were to abduct the arm, we'd see these supraspinatus fibers moving. Now to do this appropriate scan, we actually, we're gonna rotate the probe 90 degrees. So we're actually looking, our entire picture on the left here is looking between the acromium and the clavicular. You see neither bone on either side. You can see the homologue of the acromial clavicular joint here. So this is actually the homolog, and we can see the supraspinatus and a little bit of the infraspinatus tendon fibers coming under the AC joint and across. We don't see any fluid in this situation, but I find this much more sensitive. So if we abduct the arm, we'll actually see fluid being pinched on both sides of the homolog, and we'll actually see fasciculations. We'll see the bunching of the fibers under the AC joint when there's impingement. I like this view better than at the tip because at the tip, we just don't see as much. So we get this window between the two bony structures. We look like through the homolog and we can actually see what the fiber is doing dynamically. Okay. Next slide here. So um, we're using, this is a, another study about impingement, but in, we're moving on transitioning a little bit to tears. Okay. So, you know, we're taking the assumption that impingement does lead to tears. And again, this is looking at the uh, Bihana Medical Journal and uh, looking at the reliability or the accuracy of MRI versus ultrasound. And they found no statistical difference in MRI and ultrasound with supraspinatus pathology and non-rotator cuff pathology. Ultrasound showed uh, sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy of 100% for full thickness tears and basically 80% specificity and 90 I believe it's 90, I can't see. Yeah, 90% accuracy for partial thickness tears, okay? Leading them to conclude that ultrasound should be the first line when looking at shoulder pathologies due to the cost availability factors and ease on the patients. Okay? Uh, this article actually comes from a, a very well-known ultrasonographer, doctor, Dr. Nazarian. And this was actually published in the uh, musculoskeletal imaging. Basically, this is one of the more commonly quoted, you know, ultrasound studies here, but they were looking at MR arthrogram versus ultrasound and uh, basically came up, you know, with the idea and we're looking at rotator cuff tears. So they came up with the conclusion that ultrasound is as accurate as MRI for full thickness and partial thickness tears, okay? Suggesting that ultrasound should be the first line when properly trained to look at shoulder pathology. Let me keep moving here. So um, this is just a little diagram. If you're not familiar with ultrasound, you know, what we're looking at, you know, you, of course you have your free edge tears, you have your insertional tears, you've got your inner substance tears, but at the end of the day, a majority of your tears, your supraspinatus are gonna be right at the emphasis of the facet on the greater tuberosity. So if you're not familiar with ultrasound, this color-coded scheme should help a little bit. Uh, we're looking down through the deltoid, subacromial subdeltoid bursa, supraspinatus, and humeral head. We take away the cover overlies, and this is what it looks like. Okay. So if we're looking here, we can see the fibers coming up. We lose them here because, well, we're getting to articular cartilage and Sharpie's fibers. So, the sup so if we're looking for pathology and you're not completely familiar with ultrasound, you do this uh, modified crass position. You put the person in the position. This is your this is the primary target you're looking at right here, and that's where most of your rotator cuff pathology is going to occur. Okay. So let's look at have a little fun and look at some pictures. Okay, <clears throat> so this is a supraspinatus tendon, and uh, you know we can see a bursal surface tear going on here. All right, so this is a partial thickness bursal surface tear. We can see fibers coming in. I know the image looks like it's flipped from the last two. I apologize for that. But we see the fibers coming in from the supraspinatus coming into attachment. Uh, we can see a little bit of the, the facet, so the cartilage kind of thickens out. We see a little bit of the facet. There might be a little anisotropy going on here. It looks a little thicker to me. But we can actually clearly see 
on the bursal surface, we see a partial thickness tear right at the enthesis. Okay. Moving on, this is another bursal surface tear. So this was actually done uh, dynamically. I, I remember this patient we were it, everything looked normal. We had the patient in the modified crest. We were actually looking for impingement, which we found. So uh, fluid came out of the bursa and we did the impingement view. But lo and behold, right below the bursa, we see this bursal surface tear going on as well. Okay. The moral of the story is we didn't see it statically, but when the patient contracted their arm, it became apparent. Okay. So moral of the story, if you're, when you're doing ultrasound, you have the ability to stress the joint. You have the ability to fire the tendon. You have the ability to do that. You see a lot more pathology when that's performed. Uh, this is a full thickness tear. And again, I apologize for my spelling, but this is the supraspinatus tendon coming into attachment. And if you look, we analyze the bursal surface. So this white line represents our bursal surface. It's coming up, hugging the contour of the bone, and then it flattens out dramatically. There's a structural weakness in this tendon. We can see tearing here, fibers here, and we can see this really jagged appearance at the insertion site, which is your first clue there's something going on. But this bursal contour defect in the supraspinatus tendon represents a structural weakness in a full thickness tear. The next slide, we can see a more acute full thickness tear. Again, we see the bursal contour defect, but now we see fluid occupying the space. Chronic tears, you're not going to get as much fluid. Again, the ratty irregular surface of the supraspinatus insertion onto the onto the facet. Okay, and this is a more complicated full thickness tear. All right. So looking at it, we can actually see this is a trauma patient, but we see a bursal surface tear. We see probably a cortical surface tear, another cortical surface tear. Uh, and then we see this interface sign, this cartilage interface sign, representing that some of the fluid from the bursa actually got through the tendon and is sitting on top of our articular cartilage. It can only happen if there's a structural weakness in the tendon. Okay. One other side note is you can actually see in this patient, there's actually a muscular tear as well. So there's actually a muscular fascial tear between the two heads of the deltoid. So this is a very complex tear of the supraspinatus. All right, so we're moving on. So that, that's, that's kind of the stuff everybody gets into, but I think this is where it gets a lot more interesting now. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, suprascapular neuropathy, all right? So suprascapular neuropathy compression most commonly occurs at the sphenoglenoid or the suprascapular notch. Okay. Um, it's usually di clinically diagnosed by weakness and atrophy of the infraspinatus and supraspinatus um, muscles. Okay. So when we're looking at it, what do we have here? We actually have a, a mass or a cyst occupying our sphenoglenoid notch on the left here. On the right side, we have a normal looking sphenoglenoid notch. We can see the, the notch down here. We can actually see the, the little artery in there, suprascapular artery. We can see our suprascapular nerve here. On the left side, we've got this mass. It's compressing the like, artery and nerve out of the way. This person has uh, suprascapular neuropathy. Right. So it's a cyst in the sphenoglenoid notch. Now, I, I remember this particular patient. Uh, it turned out this was a ganglion cyst, which was aspirated. And this patient actually pretty much returned to normal after the aspiration. Um, this patient had seen at least five other doctors uh, before they came to us. And it was pretty obvious when we put this probe on there, what was going on. So moving along. So you have to remember the uh, suprascapular nerve. It, or, yeah, suprascapular nerve is the first branch when the C5 and C6 nerve root meet. Okay. So if someone has C5 or C6 nerve root problems, it's very likely that their suprascapular nerve is going to be affected as well. Okay. What we're looking at here on the ultrasound, we're actually looking at, this is the, the, the transverse process of C5. We can see the anterior tubercle. We can see the posterior tubercle in the body. We actually see the C5 nerve root emerging between the two tubercles. We can see our anterior scalene, middle scalene, posterior scalene. Here's our C4 nerve above. If we follow this out, we're gonna see C5. On this side, we see C5 and C6. So C6 is gonna chase C5, they're gonna merge. And it's going to be the first branch off of C5 and C6 combined. So if anybody has a you know problem with their uh, scalene muscles as these nerves go through the scalene and atypical scalene, it can compress that suprascapular nerve. So this is something important to look at as well. 
if we saw that last patient, the clinical diagnosis of uh, suprascapular neuropathy, maybe they don't have a cyst. You know, we have to look a little higher. <clears throat> So following those down, in this picture here, we have our anterior scalene and middle scalene. Our C5 and C6 are now merging, and we can see coming off the side budding. This is actually our suprascapular nerve. So it's already gone through the slips of the scalene, and now we have our suprascapular nerve. Marching that down a little bit further with the transverse cervical artery, this is the first rib pleura. Of course, we've got our larger arteries beneath, and we can actually see our suprascapular nerve here. This is a site that impingement may occur as well, especially in someone who had a trauma. Uh, someone was at a whiplash injury and they had damage to the scalene muscles. A lot of times they'll have atrophy and fatty damage to the anterior and middle scalene. Right here we have our middle scalene. So this is fat atrophy. There's a cyst occupying the space. It can put pressure on our suprascapular nerve. Going a little further, another common compression site is at the omohyoid. So this is actually where the suprascapular nerve is passing underneath the omohyoid muscle. So another important area. What you're looking for again is a ballooning pattern. So as you're scanning, you're tracing the nerve, it's gonna get bigger and then get smaller again, uh, representing a possible nerve lesion. So we're gonna move on to dislocations, all right? So I haven't seen a, a great number of dislocations. Um, I don't work in like trauma necessarily, I really haven't. Um, but this, uh, this is actually a, a simplified version. And if you read over here, the reference, this is actually uh, ultrasound dislocation by novice sonographers. <laughs> so when these novice, novice sonographers actually perform this, this study, um, 64 of 64 dislocations identified with no false positives. Right. So I, I, I see that as a, as a valuable, valuable lesson. And it, it's quite simple. Basically, they're just drawing two lines. So here's our um, humeral head. And here's our glenoid. They're drawing a line basically from the top of the, the glenoid and the top of the humeral head and measuring the distance. So in this situation, I don't see the measurement here, but this is like a plus two, and this would be a negative one. Uh, anything away from uh, from the you know deviation of 1.2, you're actually looking at a dislocation. So it, it, this is a very reliable, especially for the novice approach. This is what a big dislocation looks like. So here's our humeral head and here's our glenoid. This came into the office. It's pretty obvious what's going on right there. So we'll talk a little bit about the biceps and the labrum. Um, again, a little bit more my wheelhouse, a little bit more what I'm comfortable talking about here. So, <clears throat> so looking at the biceps in a cadaveric study, um, this was actually done in the, in the American Journal of Rotenology. And so they looked at 20 patients and they were differentiating the, the sensitivity of ultrasound for predicting labral pathology. And so sensitivity, 63%, specificity, 98%, with a predictive value of 94, and a predicted accuracy value of 86%. So that, that's actually pretty good. That's actually pretty good in this cadaveric study. Okay. So this is an anterior labrum. All right. So we're in the anterior window here. We can actually see the labral density here. We can see the articular cartilage of the humeral head. Uh, this is a little bit of the biceps tending coming into attachment. Now, this has moved over just a little bit more so we can see a little bit more of that biceps coming into attachment. You know, when we're looking at this view, it's important to contract the, contract the biceps muscle to see uh, basically if there's any separation of the two for your, your labrum or anything going on down in the labrum itself. And that's kind of what this looks like here. So in this picture, we're looking at the glenoid, humeral head. We have our long head of the biceps tendon coming in. This is done in a contraction. You can see this gap. So we have our superior glenohumeral ligament wrapping around. There's this gap this formed here. So there's actually a tear of the biceps tendon at the attachment site. And if you look at this labral density, it's quite big, amorphic. There's a cyst here. It's fractionated. This is actually a, a pretty substantial anterior labral tear going on right here. If you compare the density of this labrum to the previous, there's a substantial difference. So this is actually a, a, a labral tear in, in, in a patient here. If I remember correctly, this was actually a, a, a college volleyball player that came in for this uh, study. Uh, this is a posterior labrum. So we can actually see a little paralabral cyst and a posterior labral tear. Uh, we dynamically traction this arm. We're gonna see it, that fragment of the labrum actually moving away from the labrum itself. Okay. So I'm a big fan of looking at the rotator cuff interval. Um, 
I don't see too many people talking about this all the time. So we're actually looking at the rotator cuff interval here. So the rotator cuff interval, in essence, uh, or the uh, re re uh, retraction pulley, I'm sorry, re uh, of the biceps tendon. Okay. So the rotator cuff interval is the distance between the supraspinatus tendon and the subscapularis tendon. But in between, we have our long head of the biceps tendon, where it's actually changing direction and going over the superior glenear humeral ligament and heading down to the labrum. When someone has a slap lesion, they're actually changing the tensile forces, and most oftentimes you're going to see disruption or retraction of the superior glenear humeral ligament as well. Okay. So even if you're having a hard time seeing that anterior labrum, it's a little bit more difficult positioning. It's very easy to get to this reflection pulley. So, you know, the anatomy here, we have our supraspinatus tendon, our coracal humeral ligament going across the top, our superior glenear humeral ligament on the bottom, and our subscapularis. Okay. So to measure retraction, of course, we can measure the distance, but we put this patient in flexion. A lot of times you're going to see that, that biceps tendon, it's going to all of a sudden hug the bone. It's hugging the bone because that, that ligament is no longer intact. Okay. This is what it looks like in a cadaver. All right. This is from a study that I, I actually did. So here's our supraspinatus tendon. Here's our coracohumeral ligament coming across the top. And here's our superior glenohumeral ligament on the bottom. So it's reflecting the biceps tendon away from the bone. When this ligament is absent, you're going to see the biceps tendon. It's going to come down and smack the bone. This happens when you have a labral tear. Okay. This has been said to be pathognomonic for a labral tear. And this is actually structurally easier to visualize than the labrum itself. Okay. Here's another view of it. Again, superior glenohumeral ligament. Here's our coracal humeral ligament across the top. Subscapularis supraspinatus tendon, a rotator cuff interval. So to find this view, basically you just find the biceps tendon and go up as high as you can until it disappears. The reason it disappears is because the biceps tendon has now changed directions. All right. <clears throat> so looking a little bit more at the biceps tendon. This picture here, we have a long head of the biceps tendon in the, in the, in the groove here. And it's very easy to see this tear, right? So we see fibers missing, we see fluid around. It kind of looks like a ratty, ratty biceps tendon anyway. Here's fluid around the biceps tendon. So here's the biceps tendon. We can see a substantial amount of fluid. Uh, here's our circumflex arteries, by the way. Here's an, another view of it. We can actually see the fluid around the biceps tendon uh, coming down. Now, I, I put this in here for a reason because it's important to differentiate. Um, part of the glenohumeral joint capsule is confluent with the biceps tendon. So when you see fluid around a biceps tendon, it doesn't mean that's biceps tendon synovitis. A lot of times it's actually fluid going one third of the length of the biceps tendon because it's in the joint capsule. So if you're scanning a shoulder and you see this, this egg appearance, it's very important to figure out how far down that egg appearance goes. So if you have true biceps tendon synovitis, it's going to go all the way to the myotendinous junction. If it stops abruptly before then, you're probably looking at a fusion of the joint and, and not biceps tendon synovitis. Um, in my experience, this is probably the most commonly mistaken diagnosis that I see people make. Everyone's got biceps tendonitis when really almost everybody has fluid from their shoulder. Okay. Here's another biceps tendon. This is more of a, a tendinosis. There's some focal tears going on in here, but we've got some tendinosis going on. Uh, there's actually a little, little bit of disruption, and this is actually looking at the... Um, transverse ligaments. So this is a little transverse ligament disruption. So we know this is traumatic. This is actually calcification. So this is calcific tendinosis of the biceps tendon. Um, don't see that too often. Uh, we can grade this, of course. If we could see through it, it's grade one. If it's a uh, hard line, we grade two. If it's completely echo absorbent, meaning we don't see anything underneath, it's grade three. So this is actually a grade three calcific tendinosis of the long head of the biceps tendon. So look in here, and uh, we're going to move into a little bit of degenerative joint disease, okay? So this comes from the Journal of Orthopedic Surgical. Um, I forgot what RES stands for. I apologize. But in the study, they were looking at uh, 50 patients, and they were looking at the accuracy, reproducibility, and reliability of measuring articular cartilage with ultrasound versus contrast-enhanced micro-CT. All right. So there's a lot of numbers here. I welcome you to read them all. But at the end of the day... You know, it was found to be very a perfect agreement and reproducibility, basically between the ultrasound and the micro-assisted CT. 
So looking at the articular cartilage, if we go to our bird's beak, here's our bird's beak coming in. We can see this hard line. Here's our biceps cartilage. Anterior average is 2.9 millimeters. Looking at the posterior, here's our labrum glenoid. Here's our humeral head. We can measure it in the, in the posterior. Our posterior average, give or take, is 2.7. So if we want to make a reliable diagnosis, a reproducible, measurable diagnosis of osteoarthritis of a shoulder, looking at cartilage thickness is a potential way of doing that. Okay. Of course, in osteoarthritis, you're going to see cortical irregularities, changes of the bone, um, hard to grade that stuff, quite honestly. So if we look at actual cartilage thickness is a much, much more gradable event, in my opinion. <clears throat> All right, so moving on to AC joint. So <clears throat> here's an AC joint. What are we looking at here? Of course, we have our clavicle, we have our chromium. Uh, we can see these cortical irregularities, probably a little fluid going on in here. So this is a little fusion of the joint. We can see our ligament going across the top. This is probably a very mild you know, degenerative joint disease of the AC joint. Very common to see. This is a little bit more advanced, okay? So we have our, our step-off sign. So we know this um, chromoclavicular ligament's not doing so good. Uh, we can see a little bit more, you know, forgive my Yiddish here, but schmutz in the joint here. We've got a little bit of fluid, a little bit of schmutz going on. So there's some, so probably some little fragments of cartilage in the AC joint going on here. I always like to look at the conoid ligament as well. I don't think I put a slide in here, forgive me for that. But this is a step-off sign. It's important to grade this dynamically. Um, I like to hand the person a 10 pound weight, measure the separation, have them adduct the arm, reach across their body, and I give their elbow just a little tug on the end, see if I can get that joint to separate a little bit more to close down or I can get it to drop. Often when we go you know, just a little bit past the point of pain, we'll actually see that acromium come down and kind of touch that supraspinatus tendon. Okay. This is where we're measuring that step off. So if we were to abduct that arm, it's a different patient, of course. We're going to see, oftentimes, we're going to see that joint either close or we're going to see a uh, depression of the acromion, um, leading to a, a very likely impingement syndrome. Okay. If you look at this patient real quick, you may notice there's a little bit of regularity at the end of the acromion, right? She's going to bring me to the next slide here. So this is a non-unified acromion. So this is someone that is, is non-unified in their chromium. So they've got this non-unified chromium. Basically, it mimics a uh, impingement syndrome. Very easy to see, but uh, treatment is going to be very, very different. Right. So in this study here, we're going to move on to inflammatory arthropathies. Okay. So this basically was done to look at the intra and inter observer reliability of ultrasound for RA in a shoulder versus MRI. Okay, so these were experienced, you know, um, rheumatologists performing this, right? And what they found was a 79% agreement between ultrasound and MRI in regards to humeral head erosions, 64% for posterior recess synovitis, 31% uh, for axillary recess synovitis, 64 in regard to percent, which in regard to bursitis, and 50% in regard to biceps tenosynovitis. I question these numbers. Um, I think they were probably calling a lot of things biceps tenosynovitis that were probably a fluid because this is the easiest thing in the world to see. I don't understand. I think you get such a low number. Um, bursitis also, I think they were just mistaken with that one. But 84% for complete rotator cuff tear, which other studies we've seen 100. So it makes you question a little bit of what, what's going on here. But at the end of the day, it looked like ultrasound was a very reliable measure and we could actually track the progression of rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So what does that look like? We're looking at a posterior recess here. Okay. And so I work in rheumatology. I can kind of give you a little scoring here. Okay. So we have distension of the joint capsule beyond two cortical margins. So that's going to be, we're going to grade that a grade three effusion of the joint. 50% of our joint, we can see this. Uh, I love schmutz. It's my word. We can see the schmutz in the joint capsule. That's actually synovial thickening. So 50% or greater gives us a plus two synovial hypertrophy of the joint. And what do we have here? We have, a, we have an erosion. It's not a massive erosion changing the shape of the bone, 
So this is what you plus one erosion, but down here in the posterior parts of the glenoid, we actually see a little bit, you know, a little bit more misshape of the bone, wider erosion. If we measure this, it's probably about two millimeters wide. So this is actually probably a grade two erosion of our, uh, of our glenoid. So this is a person with active synovitis in that glenohumeral joint. Okay. According to the American College of Rheumatology, this thickness of the synovium will increase on both external and internal rotation. This is an important differentiation between polymyalgia rheumatica and rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. Moving on here, uh, this was a patient I saw, and you can see this massive, massive bursal distension right here. Okay, um, this patient actually had a Milwaukee shoulder. All right. This person had been diagnosed as having a rotator cuff tear by a couple different doctors. They'd been to five different doctors. We put it on here. Uh, Doppler lit up like a Christmas tree. Uh, we drained it, sent it to lab. Alizarian and blue stain came back positive for Milwaukee shoulder, which, uh, if you don't know, is, is a pretty horrible condition where you're probably going to have uh, natural fusion of the shoulder. So it took me roughly 10 seconds to put that probe on there and figure out something was wrong. So, again, we're looking at uh, polymyalgia rheumatica in the situation. So this is uh, from the journal Rheumatology. So ultrasound and MRI were equally effective in confirming bilateral subacromial and subdeltoid bursitis and polymyalgia rheumatica. All right. So if you're in rheumatology, this is a very, very easy way to confirm what you're looking at. So here we go. Here we're looking at polymyalgia rheumatica a little bit here. So we see bursitis fluid along the long head of the biceps, posterior recess bursitis, and we see a little bit of the subaxillary bursitis. There's a little flow chart I kind of throw in here um, for anybody who's doing rheumatology. Um, this isn't for everybody, obviously, but it's a, a flow chart, you know, basically looking at getting to diagnoses. So the thing I really like about it here is you look down at the bottom, we have we have different conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, spondylothropathy, polymyalgiomatica, gout and chondrocalcinosis. Um, this actually tells you which joints to look at in these conditions and what you're likely to see. So it ma makes it pretty easy. So uh, if you want to take this flow chart, cool, it's not mine anyway. Um, so, you know, so like spondyloarthropathy, we can look at all these different joints and look for these uh, different conditions, such as nail bed thickening, uh, nail bed obliteration, enthesitis irregularities, enthesopathy, erosions, oedema of bone, uh, polyromagic rheumatica. We have a quick differential here. Um, I, I don't want to harp on this too much because I know a lot of people probably aren't rheumatologists. Um, I can say, though, you know, I just gave a talk about rheumatology and ultrasound um, last week. Um, and the average wait time in a very well populated area for a rheumatoid arthritis patient from primary care to for an on, from onset of symptoms to seeing the rheumatologist in, in a well populated, well covered area is roughly eight months, all right? The American College of Rheumatology suggests early intervention at three months, okay? So these, so if it's eight months that goes by, now the reason they recommend that is they've actually had studies with early intervention with disease-modifying disease agents within the first three months, um, and a lot of people can put the disease into remission and actually stop the progression of a horrible condition. Um, average time is eight months. And again, this is done at the NIH and they're comparing the NIH, which has excellent care. Um, so if we can cut down that time from, from diagnosis to getting these people on, on medical treatment, I think we're doing a great job. So if you're doing ultrasound right now and you can pick up these things really quick, it, you can hasten, hopefully hasten that, that referral, get that person where they need to be. And it, it's a life changing situation. Um, you know, a lot of what we do, we, you know, we help pain temporarily, but this actually could definitely really have a major impact on somebody's life. So if you're doing any ultrasound at all, this gives you a flow chart, very easy to pick up these things, it tells you where to look. And hopefully we can get these people taken care of. Okay. <clears throat> so here we're going to, we're actually looking at a different, little bit different uh, differential here. So scapular dyskinesis. Okay. This is one of my favorites. Very common in people doing overhead activities, such as uh, serving a tennis ball. Um, <clears throat> so in this study, uh, 14,001 patients, a systematic review, um, you know, they, they looked at scapular dyskinesis, 61% prevalence in overhead activities, 33% in others. 
Um, the takeaway here, yes, it's more common in overhead activities, overhead athletes, but it could be anywhere. You know, all these patients could have scapular dyskinesis. Right. So I, I want to point out a couple things. So this is actually looking at, you know, from cadaver studies, variance in, in the scalings. Okay. So we, we, we learned anatomy very well in school. Thank you. Um, but accessory scalings exist in 25% of our population. Okay. A narrow constricted interval for C5 and C6, 13% of our population, C5 as a root goes anterior round. Uh, C6, accessory scaling is also something we see often. Um, we may have a seemingly normal patient and they've got a scaling muscle. Their C5 nerve root wraps around it. Remember the dorsal scapular nerve comes right off of the root. So before it even penetrates the scaling, so you're actually tractioning that nerve just, just anatomically. Uh, they have any atro you know, hypertrophy of that scaling, you're compressing that suprascapular nerve. Um, I think this is a lot more common. Again, this is just me, but I think this is a lot more common. I think this is why we see a lot of Im impingement syndromes. Our scapula is not uh, aligned properly. It changes, narrows the gap. We get tendon tendinopathy, tendinopathy, our tendons increase, and we start to start to get impingement. And over time, we have tears. Um, I look at dyskinesis as maybe a way of, uh, of preventing a lot of these things if we can catch it early. Okay. So when you're doing this, it's really important to look at these scalings and really understand the anatomy. Okay. Um, these are common things that happen. So these are for the dorsal scapular nerve. Um, so, you know, most commonly it goes to the C4, C5 middle scalene slip. It can go over the C4 skip slip. It can go under or over the C5 middle scalene slip. It can share a common trunk with a long thoracic nerve, again, creating tension on the nerve. It can, even in some people, actually will wrap around the anterior scalene muscle before it descends through the middle scapula or the middle, middle scalene muscle. Um, someone gets a stellate ganglion block, they may have knocked out their dorsal scapular nerve, just, just something to consider. Okay. Uh, these are, you know, common variations in, in the scalene muscles. So uh, this is the anterior scalene, you know, 20% attached C3 to C6, but 30% C3 to C7, 20% C4 to C6, and 50% only attach on C3. We are taught in normal anatomy, it's C3 through C6, but there's a lot of population out there that that's not their normal anatomy. It changes those nerve roots exiting. You're looking at C5, C6, control of the shoulder, dorsal scapular nerve, long thoracic nerve. All, all these things can be affected by this change in anatomy. Any, any change in those muscles, thickening or wasting, can have a direct impact on these nerves firing. Okay. So looking at the middle scaling here, so... You know, we, we learned C2 through C7, uh, 40% C2 through C6, that's almost half. 60% okay. have C7, so that means 40% don't. 50% attach on C2 and 50% attach on C1. So, it, you know, anytime you're looking at scapular dyskinesis, you got to look at these things. Um, C4, C5, C6, 50%, this is posterior scaling, C5, C6, and 50%. Less, less you know, less variation here, probably less... Uh, impactful on the patients, but I wanted to at least point it out. So this is my rough drawing uh, of what I commonly can see in the scalings, all right? So yes, forgive my, my artistry here, but we have our, our anterior scaling and posterior scaling. So we actually have C5 actually wrapping around and actually wrap around the, uh, the scaling. What happens is the dorsal scapular nerve is the C first branch. If this hypertrophies for any reason, you're tracking that dorsal scapular nerve. You can track the long thoracic nerve as well with any variance in C5 or C6. So this is a, a study that was done uh, in clinical neurophysiology where they looked at 41 patients. They measured the thickness of the serratus anterior, the trapezius, the rhomboids, the uh, long thoracic spinal accessory nerves, and they looked for uh, interreliability. They, they found there was there actually was interreliability in measurements of these things. Um, a pathologic nerve is generally going to be larger. And in this study, they actually proved that to be a situation in, in common entrapment sites at the scalings. Okay. So this is kind of what it looks like. We're looking at uh, C5 and C6. I'm going to skip to C5 because this is more important. So uh, we've just left the nerve root, and we can actually see it looks like it's budding right here off the side. That's our, oh, darn it. That's our dorsal scapular nerve budding right off the side as it goes through this fascia of the middle scalene. 
So this is the most common site of entrapment is right. So we follow C5 right out of the IVF. Here's our dorsal scapular nerve leaving from C5. So this is kind of C5, C6, C5 is already left. Uh, in this fascial plane, I, I put this in here to demonstrate this is middle scaling. This is also middle scaling, posterior scaling. Our dorsal scapular nerve actually travels through this fascial plane right here with our long thoracic nerve, right off C5 and C6. Again, this is variable. It's not gonna be this way in everybody. Okay. So here we're looking at the brachial plexus. So we've got C5, C6, C7 nerve roots here, scalenes. Going through the middle scalene, we can see this fascial plane. We see these two nerve density. We have our dorsal scapular nerve and our long thoracic nerve traversing right through here. Um, this picture actually came from a patient I saw yesterday. <laughs> she, she was a, a tennis player, not yesterday, uh, Monday, I believe. Uh, she was a tennis player. Uh, she was noticeably higher, two inches higher in one shoulder than the other. Um, she had a lot of pain along the medial border of the scapula. Uh, we just did a simple hydrodissection in this fascial plane. And uh, within just a couple seconds, the shoulders even out and her, her pain went away. Now we'll see how long it lasts. But uh, just something simple like that. She's been to multiple people. They told her nothing was wrong with her. Um, you know, she, had, she was on her way to, you know, sick scapular syndrome due to sc scapular dyskinesis, um, probably impingement and a rotator cuff tear. So here we're looking at a couple different things. We're going following these nerves down. I always trace these nerves. So we're here under the pectoralis. We can actually see, uh, this is not DSN, I apologize for that. We're looking at our long thoracic nerve at our, our scalene level. We can see it through the fascial plane. This can be traced down, the, down its course to the scalenes. Um, another thing to look at at scapular dyskinesis is our fascias. Um, I look at the fascias as kind of like a derailleur on a bike. It's a spring that holds everything in place. Your muscles contract to change the gears on the bike, but the fascia kind of pulls it back. It's that resistance between the two that keeps everything in line. Um, this particular patient, you can actually see right at the edge of the scapula here. We could, here actually, when we when we did a chicken wing maneuver, we could actually see the scapula puncture through the uh, the fascia itself. So she had a little fascial tear here. Um, this particular patient, we did some uh, some PRP along here. It helped considerably. Um, it's no longer piercing through. Of course, we had to immobilize her a little bit for that, but okay. So <clears throat> moving along, uh, another one, Parsner Turner syndrome. Again, we have to look at this. It's not that common. Uh, one in 126,000 people will develop this. Um, I personally have not seen it. Um, so this is a, you know, it's kind of an autoimmune condition. Um, you know, when you're looking at ultrasound, there's some, you see some uh, fascicles, swelling, uh, torsion. Uh, you see, you know, uh, basically the anterior inner osseous. But you know, ultrasound exam is useful. Uh, clinical exam, of course, is is highly useful in this. But this is kind of what it looks like. So here in the ultrasound, we can see this massive, massive nerve. All right, these nerves are not that big. So we have this hourglass constriction of our of our nerves here. This is actually going through the brachial plexus. Uh, this is what that constriction looks like on a cadaver. This is what it looks like on a slide. So it's actually this torsioning going on in the brachial plexus. And we can see all this, you know, symptoms of neuralgia going on here. All right. Looks as it looks like in cross-sectional view. So this is normal, normal, large swelling, large swelling. So it's actually being pinched and enlarged. Just like I talked about a clown's balloon. We're pinching in the middle. It's getting big on the two ends. There's actually this torsion going on with the person's brachial plexus. All right, so cervical radiculopathy. Um, this is one of the last things I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, this was done from the European Radiology Journal, and they looked at 221 patients using MRI as reference, and they measured the C5, C6, and C7 nerve root in transverse diameter and cross sectional area. Uh, what they discovered no difference between the sexes in cross sectional area and cross sectional uh, area measurements were both highly sensitive and specific for cervical radiculopathy. So the, what they did is they actually compared to normal. And if anybody wants to know normal, I, I've got them. Um, but they actually looked for enlargements of the nerve root as it exits the IVF. And they correlated with MRI findings. And they found it was very selective for cervical radiculopathy. Um, we can take this a step further. Um, say someone has their nerve leaving. You can actually see impingement on the anterior posterior tubercle, hypertrophy of that posterior tubercle. You can see where the scalene muscle is pinching it. Maybe someone's got an anomaly of their scalene muscle, like we talked about before. Uh, you know, I, I think ultrasound of the uh, brachial plexus is wonderful. 
I, I question the the uh, some of the MRI findings. I'm not sure, you know, some MRI is a little difficult in the brachial plexus, but I with a lot of study. I, I found uh, ultrasound to be very, very useful for this. So again, this is a, you know, differential for the shoulder, but if you're running a shoulder clinic, you got to look at these things. So this is kind of what it looks like. So we're looking at scalene's muscle and we're looking at the fascial planes of the scalene muscles here. So we have the C5 nerve root leaving, we have the C6 nerve root leaving here, and we have the slips of the C4, C5, C6 scalene's coming in to attach on the tubercles here. So we can actually see the long axis view of the scalene's. We'd be looking for, like I said, that clown ballooning coming out of the nerve root when it's impinged. Again, I showed this picture before, but this is what it looks like with the nerve root leaving between the anterior tubercle and posterior tubercle of C5. The enlarged anterior tubercle or chasser next tubercle of C6, the nerve coming out, measuring the transverse area, cross-sectional areas it leaves here, highly determinate with cervical radiculopathy. All right. I don't have any slides for avascular necrosis. Um, kind of like I said, if you see it, this person's already in bad shape and it should have been diagnosed already. And I don't have any of uh, these... Uh, the Cyrex with these uh, charcoal laden abnormalities, but usually those are pretty horrific too. And if you're seeing for the first time an ultrasound, I'll be, I'll be very surprised. All right. So <clears throat> thank you everybody. Um, that was fun. I hope, hope it was worthwhile for everybody to listen in and uh, I'm kind of done with the presentation here for now. Well, great presentation, Dr. Meng. Um, it's, it's amazing when I just sit through lectures with other doctors speaking, I even learn something. So I've learned a few things tonight myself that I will continue using with my scanning of the patient. So we do have quite a few questions here. Um, are you ready to answer some of them? I let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's read these questions here. First one is. Do you feel ultrasound is gaining ground on MRI and extremity imaging? Well, that, that's kind of a two-part question in my, my view. Um, you know, it's, is it gaining ground? I, I think part of that is, is it gaining ground with usage? Is it being utilized more and greater? I would say yes, but slowly. <laughs> um, is image quality gaining ground? Well, it is. Um, I, I think, you know, part of, part of what I wanted to show here is there are ways to make this reliable uh, between examiners and, you know, even do like test, retest kind of studies to make this reliable because the, the biggest knock on ultrasound to this point, you know, we can, we can show all these wonderful things and put up slides and be like, oh, here's someone who has this terrible condition. But the reality is it's, it's been poorly reliable, um, also poorly quantifiable. So, you know, part of what I wanted to do tonight was show, you know, ways of making it more uh, reliable and quantifiable. So I think implementing this can, can definitely help, you know, make it more of a mainstay in practice. Um, you know, the images are getting better, but I'll be totally honest. I, you give me an old ultrasound, I can see pretty much the same stuff as I can see on a new one. You know, they're, they're not as pretty, but when you get used to the, the grainy graysdales, scale stuff. You can, you can see stuff pretty nice. Um, I love the bells and whistles, you know, don't get me wrong. I want to use the new machine. They're fun, but the, the image hasn't changed that much. I think our understanding has changed a lot more though. And especially with new technologies coming into them, you know, uh, all these different technologies with needle guidance, uh, you know, anesthesia packages, um, you know, elastography, you know, uh, even, you know, assisted, you know, there, there's, you know, we have contrast dyes. There's, there's a lot of things we can add to ultrasound. Uh, we can couple with other, other image modalities to make an even more impactful image. But in reality, is the usage increasing? Not, not a huge amount, I wouldn't say, at least, at least in my part of the world. Very true. Yes. Next question here. Um, what is your experience finding pathology with ultrasound that MRI has missed? Um, I, I, it's happened a lot, actually. <laughs> uh, totally honest. I, I, I think part of that is um, not that the MRI necessarily missed it. A, a lot of times, you know, MRI is usually performed in an imaging center and a radiologist who's probably not on site is reading it. And they've never talked to the patient. They haven't examined the patient. Um, 
there's been, I, I don't know, there, there probably isn't a week that go by that I, I don't find something that the MRI doesn't. Um, but I have also got MRI images and I've went back through and found it. So, you know, I, I feel that MRIs, it, it does pick up stuff, but, you know, with the ultrasound and the examiner, the power of the examiner is, to, you know, hey, does it hurt when I do this? Okay, when I, when I press your arm this way, does it hurt? Was it hurt when you lift your arm here? You know, um, I'm watching what happens when it hurts. Um, you know, we, we're adding to the, to the value. At the same time, are we missing things? Oh, yeah. You know, MRI is giving you a whole picture. and Maybe I'm more focused on something else, you know. I look at, I try to look at everything on everybody, but I definitely focus more on what I think is clinically relevant. Um, so I, I would say there's probably stuff missed in that, but, uh, I've also looked at MRIs that, you know, were cut a little too short, like that, that picture I showed with the sphenoglenoid mass, uh, the person with suprascapular neuropathy, uh, or neuralgia, they, they, that was, they had two MRIs, neither one of them picked that up. But when I went back and looked at the pictures, the slides were cut too short and we didn't see the sphenoglenoid notch. Uh, I'm confident it would have been there had it been picked up on the imaging, but uh, it wasn't. Sure. Great point. Now going to transducers. Do you use like a higher frequency and mid-range frequency transducer? I, I do. So I, I tend to use uh, probably three to four transducers. So, you know, the most common setup, of course, is your linear, usually 12, 14 megahertz and a convex um, I use all those, you know, I'm using the 18, um, you know, I've got a, I've got a, a 32 that I like to use, especially, you know, cause you can tell I'm a fan of scapular dyskinesis. So looking at things like spinal accessory nerves and things like that, that really high frequency transducer is very useful. Um, sometimes you can't find it with the other. Especially in rheumatology, this finger, in the hand, of course. In the hand. Yeah. you need that higher frequency. Absolutely. Now, going to the spine, can you see mm -hmm. bulging discs with ultrasound? So, yes, but I'll put a caveat on that. You can see a lot of them. Can you see all of them? Absolutely not. Uh, in the cervical, you get a great view of the anterior disc. Um, I see bulging discs a lot in, in the anterior of the cervical. There's not really a window to see it from the posterior. In the lumbar, uh, again, I can see a lot of lateral disc impingements. Uh, you're limited by habitus, of course. Um, some people, you just can't get down deep enough. But, I, you know, is it as good as MRI sees, seeing bulging discs? No, of course it's not. But I do see a lot of them. Sure. Yeah. Okay, next question. What is the most common artifact in MSK scanning? Also, uh, are there, also are there any... Oh, another, okay, another one. Yeah, yeah multiple uh, questions here. Are there any other limitations on scanning deeper structures on larger patients? You kind of just brought that oh, up with your okay. curve linear. So there, there is for sure. Uh, the most common artifact is anisotropy. Um, you know, you, you have to be perpendicular to the object you want to see to visualize it best, um, which makes ultrasound a little tricky if you're not the one with the probe in your hand. I will say that because um, you know what you're looking at. You know, like if Mark is very experienced and I were looking at the same patient and I was, I was running the transducer, he'd look at it a little bit differently than I would because I might be looking at one structure, he's looking at something else, but I'm not putting the, the pressure on appropriately with my hand to visualize what he's looking at. Um, and it's everywhere. Anisotropy is everywhere unless you get completely perpendicular to that object. And the second part of the question, which we talked about, but yes, uh, habitus has a lot to do with, with the image quality. Um, Hydration also, you know, poorly hydrated people image not as well. Um, so there's a couple things that do affect that. But, uh, you know, lean muscle images very well. Adipose really obscures a lot of your, a lot of your picture. And smokers. Smokers too. Really That's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. And there's smokers. Don't smokers don't image well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Do you use color Doppler to find pathology? If yes, what does color Doppler tell you? Okay, so working in rheumatology, I use color Doppler a lot. Um, in fact, usually I use power Doppler. Um, power Doppler is a little bit more sensitive to the smaller vessels. Okay, so when I'm looking for synovitis or tenosynovitis especially, uh, we use the color Doppler and 
we're looking for the, the synovial pattern, basically in a tendon or, or the synovium. What does it tell us? Uh, well, looking at serology studies, it actually tells us that mostly if there's VEGF, um, IL-1, IL-6, IL-27, and, uh, and a little bit of tissue necrosis factor in the joints. So looking at synovitis, if you're looking at it, you know, at TNF alpha, someone who's TNF alpha driven disease, you're going to see a lot more speculation. Um, and a you know, step back from that, the power Doppler really, you know, is, is, a, is a very good but not perfect measurement of synovial activity. Great. Last question here. If a patient can't do abduction, fingers cannot reach back until the thorax. What's you wrong fingers? with the muscle? Fingers yes. cannot reach back to the fingers thorax. cannot reach back into the thorax. What could be wrong with the muscle? Oh wow. <laughs> um oh, well, a lot. Um <laughs> so <laughs> that that's not, not not quite sure I understand the question totally. Um, but fingers cannot reach back into the thorax. So we were talking about shoulder. So I'm assuming this this is a, a, a shoulder question more than anything. Um so I've got to be, you know, thinking of, you know, adhesive capsulitis. So for one thing, um, you know, possibly torn, torn muscle to, to kind of get to that question. Um, possibly myositis, taking it from a, a muscular question, which you can see findings of, of myositis with ultrasound. Um, can I, I, you know, with not being able to touch the thorax, I, I, I got to be thinking more joint related stuff than, than muscle most of the time. Yeah. Sure. Well, that's it of the questions from the, the guests here. I greatly okay. appreciate your time, Dr. Meng, on your shoulder presentation. Appreciate it greatly. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Frank? Okay. Uh, Dr. Man, I on behalf of Wisconsin Medical, thanks for your excellent presentation. It is very detailed and thoughtful, and there are so many demo pictures inside. We really appreciate it. it. And we would, we would like to cooperate with you for more webinars or other events in the future. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mark, and uh, thanks a lot again for your efforts. You really ask the professional questions from the audience. You're very welcome. Appreciate okay. it. Thank so you. everybody in the broad, uh, broadcasting room, thanks for your watching today. I believe you got a lot of inspiration today. I would like to invite you to join our webinar on next Thursday again. Dr. Ryan Martin will present the third webinar with the topic on ultrasound in MSK practice, elbow. Let's stay tuned. So, Good night, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Mark, again. Uh, You're welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.